Hey, hey, it's Rich Sheffron here, and uh, not my new normal uh, place to broadcast from, not my normal setup, but I figured uh, better to do it than not do it, especially when I had really valuable stuff to share. So I'm in Baltimore. I'm in my hotel room because I decided to get out of the office a little bit early today. So I want to say hello to everyone. And um, where is eyeglasses? Hold on a second. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're also, let's see. Oh, wow. Okay. So uh, great to see everyone. Uh, looking forward to sharing what uh, I plan on sharing with you here. And so if this is your first time joining us, it'd be great to hear where you're joining us from and what you do. And if this is your uh, a veteran of these Facebook lives, uh, let me know that you're here and where you're from as well. Um, always good to say hello to friends from all over the world. And it's so cool that we do. Um, so yeah, so we're going to talk about really this idea of who's the most important person, um, or the most important thing or the most important perspective that you can take really to, uh, achieve the success that you want to have. And, um, and I actually came upon what we're going to talk about today really as a passing kind of thought uh, when I was working on a different presentation. I'm going to tell you all about that because um, I think it'll also give you insight into how I think and maybe that's helpful for some of you. Um, how I go from, you know, basically taking a thought into an idea into something bigger, who knows. So we'll talk about that a little bit. And um, let's see, obviously, as I've said, I've been doing these Facebook lives ever since we started the quarantine, things are kind of crazy out there. And, um, and so uh, I thought it would be a good idea to just share what I know and to help as many people as I can. And so we're doing them every Tuesday and Thursday, Tuesdays at 2 and Thursdays at 6 p.m. And um, usually I'm doing it from the gym in our Hamptons house, but today I am doing it from the Indigo Hotel in Baltimore that is at 12% occupancy. And um, the offices are still closed, so when I go in there, it's just me and Matt Pete, and uh, that's been about it. And uh, so let me, should we dive into this? I guess so. Oh, one last thing. Uh, you know, another reason we're doing this is to help get the word out and uh, just basically to be in more centers of influence, really. And uh, so along those lines, if you can let Facebook know that you're enjoying these uh, by doing all the things that they look at, like commenting, like sharing and telling others, like uh, giving an emotional reaction, or if you're watching this on YouTube, um, then subscribe, uh, get alerts, those things, thumbs up, etc. So with that said, um, you know, I had this interesting conversation and I'm going to pull a bunch of different thoughts together and I hope that, uh, that's enjoyable for some, uh, thank you guys. The, uh, and so for those just joining us, be really cool to know where you're coming from and, uh, this is your first or last. <laughs> um, all right, so I uh, I want to share with you just a bunch of like thoughts that have kind of come up in my head recently as it relates to business, something I'm working on. And one of the things was, as I was talking to a friend of mine, James Von Ellswick, and uh, he wants me to prepare a presentation for him and Nick Shackelford. They're doing this big event, uh, I think this weekend. Um, yeah, I think this weekend. And or early next week. And so want me to do a 20 to 30 minute presentation on how I learn, uh, because the people that know me best tell me that my ability to learn and synthesize information is one of the things that really makes me stand out. And so, so I said I would, and, um, then we got on to talking about other things and, um, just, there we go. Okay. Uh, and you know, we started talking about, you know, quarantine and things like that. And what was new with him and what was new with me. And he was saying that, you know, he actually had made a lot of personal progress on while he was uh, during quarantine. And part of that reason is because he's been at a uh, stuck at a friend's apartment and uh, the friend isn't there. So he's just been like hunkering down by himself. And uh, when I asked him for one of the an example of what he meant by that, like what's better, he told me, I wish I could get this slightly better. Um, he told me that he used to use his pattern recognition 
uh, more so for in reactive situations, that would be the only time that he would normally do it. There we go. Okay, I just got up my thing here. Uh, let's see. I'm using my regular standard webcam. Um, is it, should I get it right? Is this working? Oh, maybe not. Hold on. Oh, let's see here. This time. Oh, I have to my glasses. It's not necessarily. All right. So it's not working. All right. So anyway, um, so that he's more. Uh, he used to use them only in the moment in a reactive situation, and he's being more um, proactive or things like that. And so I asked him to, you know, explain more. And he was telling me like he had a conversation with this other friend of ours and how he was saying how many things aboard that gets wrong. And the big takeaway of that conversation was that when you do one thing extremely well, you can do a lot of things wrong and still be immensely successful. And, um, and so he was saying that, um, that that is very similar to what him and I were talking about earlier about how Agora is an offer factory and how they don't, they, nothing can slow down the pace of offers. That's really the, the way of looking at things inside. And that the reason for that is that we're in the hit business. And so, uh, and Mark Ford had described to me years ago that he never had anything start shitty or mediocre turn into a home run. And so we're in a hit business and the world has moved into a winner take all kind of game. And so it would make sense then that you wouldn't want to slow down your offers, right? To make them better offers because it will either work out of the gate or it will not be the home run that you really need for growth. And, um, and then that kind of reminded him of this uh, thought that he had about this other big affiliate, one of the biggest affiliates online, who, when undertaking a new campaign, will do all like, you know, three dozen different creative approaches, spend a thousand on each to see which one resonates. And also with this idea that like, you will more swings at bat as opposed to tweaking, uh, will guarantee, will increase the likelihood of a home run much more so than tweaking. And so like this now becomes like a something that he doesn't only figure out when he's working on something, but something he's figuring out in advance. And then kind of, I would call it a power law of, um, of direct response for sure, maybe online marketing in general, but the idea that uh, hits are hits and nothing starts, nothing that starts out crappy ever becomes a home run. That, that now, take that with a grain of salt, right? It doesn't mean like we're talking about in a controlled environment, but like that's a power law that then helps adjust how you respond to things. And so that was kind of in my head. And um, I started thinking about this presentation about learning and how I learn and why would people say that that's one of my strengths, my, you know, how my ability to learn and synthesize and um, what is it that I do differently? I know I do quite a bit differently, but is there anything more than that? And, and how could I do it even better? And so my thought always kind of goes to that when I'm working on a presentation is to go further than, um, than where I currently am. And the reason I do that is one, it's one of the only times I'm motivated to do that. Um, so I want to take advantage of it, even if it's a form of creative procrastination in a way. Um, but two, since it's the only time I do it, um, it's the only time then I can actually raise my game. And so I look forward to these times when I'm working on something and breaking down something I do, because it gives me the opportunity to do it even better by the time I'm done breaking it apart. And I think that should make sense for people. So I'm doing it on how I learn, why, and like some of the underlying thoughts behind it. And, um, and so we had this conversation, you know, during some of these live streams that, um, I know I've shared this thought that most entrepreneurs build the business around some mythical entrepreneur that doesn't exist. They design a business for who they think they ought to be, not who they really are. And I see that as being one of the biggest mistakes that people make online and, or even offline really to be uh, frank. So with that said, 
Um, the right way to do it is to design a business that's actually where you're very clear about your flaws, but the business can be successful as it is currently, right? And so, so that we've talked about that and that, that you're not going to be, and there's a, there's some presuppositions in that thought. They're like kind of packaged in, right? That when I say that, um, if your business needs you to be someone different than who you need, who you currently are, the likelihood of your business success is rather small. And that, and one of the reasons why, right? And I'm just trying to figure this out as we speak. That's why if I'm staccato a little bit, I'm thinking as I'm talking. Um, if, if we want to understand why, you know, personal change is really hard. And that, you know, there was a famous book about 10 years ago, Change or Die, where, you know, people were who are faced with that decision, they either have to change their lifestyle or die, 90% don't change. And that's why the book is called Change or Die, that only 10% end up actually changing. And so why would you put your business success on the line for your personal change when you know that personal change is hot, is very, very difficult. Okay. The presupposition in there, though, is that um, that the mistake that people make is that uh, that they are magically going to be better than who they currently are. And with no plan in place of why they would be better from, uh, you know, and that so there so that got me really thinking about my future self. Because one of the things that when I spoke about learning to learning productivity hacks, like a bigger kind of umbrella than just learning. Uh, one of the things that I was, I was, I spent a considerable amount of time on was this thought that I am going to take the path of least resistance that, and so I don't make the best choice, but in, mo in moments when I'm on autopilot or whatnot, I make the easiest choice. And so with that, um, with that understanding that I'm going to make the easiest choice, not necessarily the best choice, how do I make the best choice, the easiest choice? And, and so that, that then allows me to kind of alter my environment. Um, so that, for example, um, if the normal thing I do when I'm done with work, whenever, uh, and I go into my den, totally like fictitious story here, and I turn on the television um, without really thinking about it, what I could do is I could take the batteries out of the remote and put them in the kitchen or wherever. And now what I, I have to make it worth my while. It's not that I can't watch television, of course I can, but to not make the least productive thing will also be the easiest thing because most of the times you will take the easiest thing. So with that stated, right? Um, I'm just trying to like keep thinking about the thinking process. All right, so one of the things that I learned from Tiago Fort was that where like you're building a second brain, like you never know that whole process that he teaches. Um, what you're really doing is you're leaving um, notes for your future self. And so uh, so so thinking about what will be easiest for your future self um, and the context is is really useful. And so all of these disparate thoughts were going on around in my head. And it really got me starting to think about future self. And if you could know better, well, let's start there, right? It, 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 uh, it helped me really kind of um, start thinking about future self. And you could say that part of my midlife crisis, like in my early 40s, was that I met my future self and I didn't like my future self or I wasn't happy being my future self. I became my future self and realized I hadn't chosen 
correctly. And so, you know, there's a lot of people have goals, right? And of what they want to do or what they want to achieve, right? Or what they want to accomplish or uh, get, you know, whatever. Um, and so their goals are plans to, um, are plans to create those goals into um, reality. However, um, if you've ever been around someone, if you can think about someone who has, in an area, has achieved tremendous success, what you recognize is it's not only what they do that makes them successful, although that's part of it for sure. The other is like what they notice, what they see, what they say, what they don't say, like it's all those other things, right? Um, you know, when you have, ever, if you've ever said to yourself, so-and-so would know the right thing to do, right? Like in some situation, right? It's basically saying that they could probably see more of what's currently going on based on their past experience. And so when we think about uh, our future selves, and most of us don't, um, don't think very much about their future selves at all. Um, we tend to make some mistakes about our future self that uh, tend to cause challenges. Um, so, so the one who kind of took some notes, so I'm just kind of um, so, you know, the reason I'm bringing this up, like this idea, right, that there's um, that a, someone who has true expertise in a field uh, does more than just do it, that they have a different map of the world. They see the world differently. And because they see the world differently, um, they notice different things. And because they notice different things, they can do different things, right? Things that other people can't even see. It, 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 like it doesn't exist. The opportunity doesn't exist for people. And so there, so if we are going to pursue a goal, right? And here, like I'm thinking about learning because I got to create this presentation on learning. It would seem to make sense that we would not only think about like what we want to have, what we want to achieve, what we want to accomplish, all those things, but who do we need to be in order for that whole picture to to be as easily uh, achieved and as easily maintained and, as possible. And flushing out a picture uh, and a, a clear idea of like what you would need to be, you know, so that um, so that you actually do that work, that you then have a clear idea of um, what it is that that future state that you're aiming for uh, is. And that's not to confuse that we're always someone different because we kind of are, but that who are the people that we're going to be in the future, right? And how do we engineer it so that we're more in line with what we want and what we want to get and what we want to achieve and what we want to do, but from a perspective of who do I need to be? And I think that's critical. Um, I'm jumping topics here again, but I hope you see that. Hopefully I'm making sense so far. Am I advancing the conversation? I, I, I hope so. Let me know. Um, Cause if I am, uh, I'm trying to think this through as we're talking, right? I'm, I'm trying to kind of work it out in my head as we talk. Like I just have a bunch of notes that I acquired, uh, that uh, about this and I wanted to share it because I thought it would be a good way also for me to kind of get my head around it. So, all right. So I think it's a challenge, right? I think it's a challenge that most people aren't aware of what their future self, what future self they're even aiming for. And that's a problem because like with theory of constraints, for example, when you start using the maps of theory of constraints, um, 
you know, you're going throughout the process. One of the things you're going to be doing is you're going to be finding root causes, uh, core constraints of the business. And, um, and so to get to those core constraints, you have to, um, you know, you do what's called the current reality tree and you're using rules of logic to do like, you know, a more advanced version of the five whys, like why does that happen and why does that happen and why does that happen? The, but because we start with the problems, right? We need to kind of set up system boundaries of where we're gonna pull problems from, right? Like problems as they relate to what? Because there's always lots of problems. So what you do in theory of constraints is, is that you have a model of what currently is, and then you have another model. And the other model is if this business, this system was completely dialed in in every way, was achieving its goal exactly as it should, what would it look like, right? And so now you have the before, the current, right? And the after, the goal. And now you have the borders or boundaries around the system so you can say, why isn't this like this? Like what, you know, and now all the problems are gonna come out. Like, well, it takes us, six months to complete a one month project and we're always behind and you know whatever the issues are and they become the problems that we start with well it would seem to me that if you're going to want if you're going to spend the time learning um you want to make sure that that learning uh one advances you get the maximum leverage from it especially if it doesn't require any more effort Right. That it, like if you can get more out of the time you spend on books and I mean, get more in any which way you want to define success, then. You should do it. And I'm also so now another ADD moment here, but this is to me, it's very much related there. When we talk about like that power law with James, right, like this idea that when you're in a hit business, uh, it's number of swings at bat, not micro changes that matter and you know when you layer on top of that like a mental map like winner take all society you recognize that that's even more important today right and so what james was saying is is that he now has that as like a tool a way of looking at the world right um and to apply in different places uh for different things kind of like what i was originally saying i had learned from jay abraham that that's how he looked at his techniques and you know what was really interesting to me is that i have had the experience for so many years of not ever really having a problem working out because i have a rule to myself that is if i don't feel like working out um i don't have to but i have to get on the machine for five minutes and then if i want to get off i get off and i do every once in a while although it's very rare and so that always worked out really well for me and that the end i also because most of the time once i did five minutes i felt great and so the takeaway there that i should have taken away is that my feelings are inconsequential before start my feelings about doing something are irrelevant until i'm actually doing it okay but i didn't internalize that that was just my strategy for working out and i had the experience many many times of opening my journal and not wanting to write and within a few sentences like touching a nerve and now writing pages after page after page and being like wow i really had a lot to share i didn't think i had anything um and yet still i didn't appreciate that this strategy was more powerful than i was giving it credit for because when i was talking to uh katrina ruth about writing you know she said basically my workout rule for writing, like she writes for five minutes and then she decides. And what was crazy to me and still is, is that that never occurred to me. And it's not that everything should occur to me because it certainly shouldn't, but here's a strategy that I actually use that like has worked for me so well in one area of my life. And yet it never occurred to me to apply in other areas of my life where I might be struggling to start things and, and stuff like that. So, and yet, life would be so much easier, right? If we, um, if we found a strategy that worked for us, appreciated its power and, um, uh, and we're able to, um, 
apply it in all the places that it could allow us to apply it. And also, I think it can eventually, by knowing the rules, I think that like if you look at the top people in any market or industry or profession, um, the top have more of those like ways of seeing or power laws, if you want to call them, or um, boundaries, uh, not bound personal boundaries, but what they see in the world, distinctions and uh, mental maps. And because of that, uh, they see things that others can't see and so they do things others can't do. And I think that figuring out a way to get that is really exciting. So I think from a learning perspective, um, it's about understanding who you want to be, right? And then from there, um, building out that picture, okay? So that's called precognition, if you didn't know. And uh, it's projecting yourself out into the future. Uh, and then, you know, noticing what you feel and what things, you know, et cetera, right? Like seeing things and feeling things as you would if you were there. So some things to think about that I think would be useful, and we're not really talking about it from a learning perspective here. Uh, we're talking about it from a business perspective. And so I believe that your future self is probably the person that you should have the closest relationship with as it relates to your business. Now, what's interesting is uh, when they've done uh, research um, I forget the part of the brain, but it's over the right ear, uh, one inch up, one inch back. So this part of the brain right there um, is, is it that part of the brain? Yeah, it was that part of the brain. Um, that is responsible for um, is that the one? Yeah, is responsible for um, how we um, how comfortable we feel, how much empathy we feel, how connected we feel. And, um, and so we're most connected and feel the most empathy for ourselves. Um, potentially also for our past selves. But when we think of our future selves, we use the part of the brain that thinks about strangers. So we are short wired to not think of our future selves uh, very far out into the future. And it, and what we are, when we're making a decision about the right thing to do often, right? We're making a sacrifice as our present self for this future self. Um, cool that, um, thanks Chris, for this future self that we feel as close to as a stranger. So I think that's a, that's a problem. So, uh, so part of the thing is to get to know your future self, right? So one thing that keeps people young, keeps creativity sharp, keeps the brain sharp, um, and makes life worth or more meaningful is having experiences, right? So, what th one thing to think about are all the experiences that you want to have as you get older, okay? As your future self, as a way of starting to build out a pi picture. Um, I want to get back to this. Um, back to that. All right. We're getting there, guys. Um, so, like, if you think about your ideal day, for example, um, then... Uh, yeah, what kind of person do you need to be in order to, one, create that ideal day, but two, to maintain that ideal day in the easiest way? What, what values would you have to have? What kind of approach would you have to have to work? Um, you know, what, et cetera. And then I've got a bunch of other questions here um, about that. All right. All right. Um, 
Okay. So what experiences would you like to have? What, uh, what would that future self need to be good at? What does that future self look like? Uh, what would that future self need to know? Um, what kind of presence uh, does that future self have? Um, you know, it's like if you see a five-year-old and then the next time you see that five-year-old, the five-year-old is a 10-year-old. It's rather incredible the progress that happens from five to 10. If you see that 10 year old another five years later, it once again is rather incredible the amount of progress that happens from 10 to 15. There should be no different throughout your entire life. But if you see a 55 year old person and then you see them when they're 60, they probably haven't grown very much at all. Um, and that's partly, even though we will change, change is a given. We will consistently change. Uh, Daniel Gilbert just created a new presentation. Well, I don't know how new it is, like last year or two, um, I think, uh, talking about our future selves. And uh, it's like a six minute TED talk. And Daniel Gilbert is the gentleman who wrote Stumbling on Happiness, Harvard professor, really sharp guy. And he said, we walk around with the illusion that we finally have just become who we were meant to be that we somehow think that change is going to be a lot slower from this point on and that from this point on is wherever we currently are that we make the mistake um of thinking that quote human beings are works in progress that mistakenly think they're finished the person you are right now is transient as fleeting and as temporary as the people you have ever been. And if there's something that you don't want to do, right, to think that your future self will want to do that thing uh, is highly unlikely. And so what needs to change about who you are, right? Um, and I'm not suggesting that you and if I'm not suggesting that you have to change who you are to be successful, but when you know who you need to be, uh, recognizing you're changing all the time, uh, that then and you know what you need to know and you know what you need to be good at and you know what you need to be able to spot, um, then and you recognize that you're more often than not going to take the path of least resistance. How do you uh, design your life so that you're supporting your future self as much as possible? And so, you know, you're designing for yourself on your worst day, not yourself on your best day. Um, and yeah, we, we don't do what's best, we do what's easy. You, we want to identify with that future self. Um, and ultimately, therefore, use that future self to motivate our present selves. Uh, so I had this thought, right, that like we should really treat our future self like we, che we treat our children. And that I, I don't, I remember telling... Uh, I think I think I've told it on one of these live streams that something I learned about myself recently was that um, when I feel accountable to someone else, I'm actually a better entrepreneur. And what I meant by that was, is that sometimes I know what the right thing to do is, but because I want to avoid confrontation or I want to do something else, I don't do it. But when I feel accountable to someone else, then I do. Excuse me. Um, and... So I was thinking like two, two thoughts here. One was, you know, obviously you want to do as much as you possibly can to ensure your kids have a good life. If you took that same approach for your future self, um, 
life would continue to get easier and easier, right? Like, you know, when I taught the theory of constraints course, GPS, oh, you know what? I haven't even put up on the screen, join our Facebook group or nothing. Um, when I, uh, when I taught the course GPS, um, that's too big now. There we go. Um, one of the first assignments I told people to do before we really got underway, like told them what they should do on day one, was to, uh, to make a list of everything that's frustrating in their life. Uh, every little detail of everything frustrating. You know, if it's a door handle that doesn't work well, you know, from their bedroom to their bathroom, or, you know, whatever their rug always comes up, whatever it is, write all those things down and then do your best to eliminate them in the next, you know, 72 hours. And the reason why I wanted people to do that was I wanted them to eliminate as much friction from their lives as possible because they were about to undergo a pretty intense learning experience. And those things all kind of suck the energy out of you. And so anytime that you remove friction out of your life, you're also helping your future self because it's one less thing, right? That has to be done, has to be dealt with. And I really like the idea of these two thoughts, holding these two thoughts. One, like treat your future self like you would your child. And the other is, is that you do have accountability in life. You have maximum accountability to the person that you will, that you are currently becoming. And that that's who you have ultimate accountability to, to the person that you're becoming. And that's another reason why you have to pull that future self in. You have to understand what that future self, uh, who that future self needs to be and what they need to know how they need to see the presence that they have, uh, and so forth. And so let's see. So that's kind of where my head's been at. Um, I think one of the easiest, not easy necessarily, but one of the, one way that I think would be helpful is to project out some amount of time in the future, uh, a decade five years, 10 years. Uh, and, you know, if you already have goals that take you out to that period of time, great, use those. But if you don't, think about what would be, I always like to start with the ideal day. And if you can't do that, start with everything that would not be a part of the ideal day and then use the opposite of that. Um, but because we have to put a stake somewhere in the ground. So if you can describe your ideal day, right, then how do you support that ideal day? You know, what kind of business do you have? How does it run? And then who would you need to be to have all that and have it work? Right. And um, and then from that vantage point. Um, how do the dots connect from where you are and where they've been kind of uh, coming from to this new location? What's going to get you there? And. I think one of the things is, is like, yeah, kind of like what I was saying with theory of constraints, like there's the current you, there's the future self. And, uh, and now what is, if everything goes smoothly, um, what's in that future self that doesn't exist in the current self and why? Right. And what is required to um, to make the future self look like make the current self look like the future self. The other thing, another thing I learned from theory of constraints was that, um, you know, I started with a goal. Business making one hundred and fifty thousand a month. And then I asked, what are all the things I'll need? in order to, well, why don't I have that, right? Why isn't my business $150,000 a month business? And, 
and I had all these reasons. And you know, we needed an affiliate uh, army, um, et cetera, et cetera. And we didn't have any affiliates. We needed front end products. We didn't have any front end products, so on and so forth. And uh, I felt a big release of energy actually by just, it was the first time I ever started planning by what I didn't have. Um, so it was just good getting that out. And I thought that was interesting. Then uh, the next step was to then put them in sequential order. Like what would you, so now you have all these things you're missing, like what needs to come first, what needs to come second, what needs to come third. And I hope it's clear that now I'm talking about a totally different thing than what I was just talking about. Um, as far as like, this is a different map, different strategy. Um, the, so now you're putting them in sequential order. Like, you know, if, you know, which comes first, the front end product or the affiliates or the traffic or, you know, what, in order to have this, I must have that, you know, and so you're putting them in sequential order. And, uh, and that's really easy to do because you just compare one to one, then to the next one, to the next one, to the next one, and wherever it comes before, then you stop and take the next one. And so it's, and you just keep comparing. Um, so now you have them in sequential order and you map it out, like what you would need to do, like not like the overarching steps, not, you know, in detail, detail, but like, you know, a couple steps for the whole process, right? You're not going crazy here. And what I noticed was that when I looked at the map that way of how I was going to get there, um, there was a challenge exercise that I learned, like, how would you do it if you had to do it 10 times as fast or 10 times more effective? And what I recognized was I could build a $150,000 a month plus business with just a report and I'm high, well, at that time high end, now it's low end, uh, coaching program. And, uh, and I only saw that because I saw all the steps um, mapped out and saw what they were trying to achieve. And so I think that when you're clear about who you need to be in the future, right? Who you need to be responsible to um like i'm thinking that possibly like in my when i write my journal in my e in the evening maybe i am writing to my future self um about what i did for them today and uh where i let them down um you know etc because you know it's not about living your life all for your future either right it's this is a mental exercise to make yourself more motivated to take action when you need to take action, to be more purposeful on the stuff that you learn, be more purposeful in what you build in your business, because you have a much clearer idea of who you need to be and what you need to know and what you need to have. And because of that, that's what you're in the process of actually building and doing. And you now have this accountability buddy called your future self um that appreciates you as you know for everything that you are and also trusts you with everything that they have that you will do the right thing for them so that was a main block right like the 45 minutes of what's been on my mind about this idea of future self. And I just think it's really, really powerful. And I don't feel like I've really scratched the surface. I do think that there's applications to learning. There's definitely applications to being the best entrepreneur you can be. And definitely, you know, um, recognizing that the more that you can recognize that what you do is you take the path of least resistance that you choose what's easy is not best. How do you engineer um, your day, your life, et cetera, so that you actually, um, so that you actually do get the best out of yourself? Because if you're going to work, if you're going to work, then you might as well work. And if you're not going to work, oops, let's move this around, uh, then better off to not pretend you're working because that that's never beneficial. Um, so. <sighs> You know, I was listening to this. I want to get better at this approach. I was listening to a video, I think last week, uh, of Jordan Peterson, 
and he was talking about how he prepares for his lectures. And he was saying he thinks about a problem and then he thinks about a bunch of stories. I didn't think of enough stories uh, that relate to that problem. And then he is going to try and figure it out on the fly with the audience. And I thought that was really interesting. And I thought it would be a good idea for me to kind of test that out. I certainly could do a better job of it, but, um, but it, yeah, it was interesting. I'm going to have to think about what I learned out of it. Um, you know, how, and so, so a couple thoughts, right? Uh, and then let's, I want to say hello to everyone and all that. Um, so that's, I, this is what happens for me, you know, like, uh, and this is what can get me into trouble if I don't rein it in that, um, you know, so it started with a presentation on how I learn. I had this thought about how we're not as clear as we need. Like when I read a book, I have a general idea of what it is I'm looking for so that this way I'll know when I spot it, I'm not just reading. And, um, and so my thought is, is that most people don't have that strategy when it comes to reading and they certainly don't have that in a, any kind of meta level of um, what they're looking for, what they feel they need to really find uh, to have their, to make their future as ideal as possible. And so if you're going to spend time learning, uh, why not try and master those power laws and see what they are in your field that gives you the, the most amount of ability for the least amount of effort? Why wouldn't you do that? And why wouldn't you start learning the things that you think you would need to know to be the person that you need to be? And so that's where it started. And, you know, uh, a bunch of articles later uh, and some review of some old book notes of mine. And uh, I probably spent, I don't know, two hours thinking about this today and then another hour here talking to you guys about it. And uh, I do need to go back to doing the actual uh, presentation on, uh, on learning, which I'm excited about. Uh, it's more than just learning. It's more about understanding that we live in a world that is full of information. And we need information to do basically anything and everything that we do. So therefore, how you manage the information flows in your life make a world of difference. Um, and, uh, you know, small shifts in your behavior can make radical differences over time, especially when we're talking about uh, some future time years and you know years off so with that all said let's say hello see who's joined us um sorry that uh i got into things so hey look, let's move this i can take this off for a few minutes about our facebook group hey Kayvon, good seeing you hey christy uh good to see you tim from the gold coast australia marcus from honolulu us Hey, how's it going? And Richard, I love your name, uh, from Santa Barbara. Uh, Clinton Smith, very cool. Uh, hi, Rich, good to see you here again. Hope you and your family are fine. My question for you today is, what is the number one skill a new business owner must have to make enough money to cover a monthly expense and have a profit? Well, uh, that's easy, I guess, the way you're asking, especially. Um, the number one skill is to sell. Now, how you sell, there's a million different ways, but the, you know, business is a like, is a game like Monopoly. When you run out of money, the game's over. And there's, you know, I think this is kind of a, potentially a gunslinging kind of entrepreneurial thing to say, so maybe it's not the smartest thing, but, um, but there's no problem that revenue can't fix. And so the most important thing is being able to sell. And that might mean being really good at sales. That could mean being really good at marketing. But at the end of the day, it's the per it's not the best coach that makes the most money. It's a person who's best able to market or sell coaching, right? So most people, most entrepreneurs focus on really the wrong thing. Um, what makes you the best at marketing or uh, selling a thing as opposed to being the thing 
is falling in love with your customers and prospects, not your product. So I hope that helps. But the number one skill is being able to get cash in and service or product out. Uh, hey, David Ross. Good to see you in Scotland, buddy. Uh, Jason from Tampa. Don, good evening. <laughs> Very formal, Don. Uh, Eli, I am having a good day. I hope you are too. Winter Haven, Florida. I know Winter Haven. It's a nice area. Uh, greetings from Germany. Wow. Well, greetings back to you, Francis. Christopher Vogelman, the one and only. Uh, Coronado Island. And Jay from Toronto. Uh, well, today I'm in the hotel, Jay. Uh, this is my hotel room. Um, but I, do, I, I have been in the office quite a bit. Uh, Giselle from Trinidad. Uh, don't know how I would pronounce that. Ma, ma, ba, uh, from Nigeria. Yeah. Yeah, we're at a 12% occupancy here. Um, I hope I delivered Scott. Redondo Beach, home of Jay Abraham, or at least some, he had an address there. Uh, happy to have you here, Clinton. Martin from Buffalo, he lives in Vancouver. John is from the UK. Susie is Lake Lure, North Carolina. <laughs> oh, this is the first time, Susie, you're on one of my Facebook lives. Very cool. Uh, Eric from the Lofton Islands of Norway, Chris Daly from Maryland, Jose from Connecticut, Don from Columbus, Tom from Connecticut, Charlotte from Greece. Oh, cool. You're working with Michelle Schaefer. Very cool. I'm a fan of Michelle Schaefer's. Uh, uh, so this is the point of view that the number of attempts you make is the most important factor in eventually getting a hit. Well, uh, I imagine this relates to what um, what I was saying earlier. Um, the whole business is designed around that. I did a video on that, on why the newsletter is the perfect front end. And that's in the Facebook group. I think you just got to scroll down to like towards the beginning of the time, or maybe there's a way to see the videos. If you can't find it, maybe I'll post it. Um, so you guys will have to let me know, but, um, to a certain amount, all other things being equal, like we already have really good copywriters who have a really good method. And so, yes, that better to, um, do lots of tiny experiments. Like we were talking about God knows how many live streams ago, um, and see what resonates than to, know that something that doesn't resonate is not going to resonate deeply. But that's a model that works for them. That's not the only model. That's a model that when applied by someone who's really good at copywriting uh, and knows how to do the math of direct response can build a large company. Uh, I was in rehab for heroin and was and one in five who tried to change or succeed out of the six of us to change. Got it. Yeah, personal change is hard, no doubt about it. Uh, won't take in constructive action and new habits help to erase magical thinking? Um, yeah, well, you know, there's like this, we tend to be overly optimistic about our future too, which is somewhat problematic, um, which hopefully does get past magical thinking. Um, wow, good for you. Um, I don't know what I said that was good, but okay. Uh, the easiest choice can be the best choice if you love to create new things. Yeah, but Christopher, if you love creating new things and then never say take anything to its full completion nor have a strategy for that, then it becomes problematic, right? Um, so yeah, we want to um, we want to set up guardrails on both sides. I guess is my point. I was just reading Tiago's Power Articles. They're really good. Well, Tiago's just a great writer, uh, which is because he's, he has great ideas. Uh, building a better brain is better than building a better mousetrap unless you're trapping your future self for greater good. <laughs> Funny, Chris. Um, Rich, your learning ability helps greatly. The amount of information that's coming out all the time. 
coming out faster than most of us can process it, make it hard to make good decisions in business in today's world, not to mention being able to read past information to use as a guide to judge a new way. Well, I think, Don, that, that brings up a really important point, and I think this is also something I learned from Tiago, um, which is that, like, because we are surrounded by information all the time, and we work with information and data, um, and the amount of it is accelerating and accelerating and accelerating, um, you have to change the metaphor. Uh, so George Lakoff, a very famous uh, linguistic professor, I guess, uh, he wrote, um, wrote a lot about framing. Uh, don't think of a pink elephant, that was him. Uh, and the metaphors that we have, we carry around in our mind. And, um, and the metaphors that we carry around in our mind actually make quite a big of a, quite a difference and how we perceive things and therefore how we react to things. And uh, so one distinction that Tiago made, and I don't know where he made it, but I remember it coming from him in some way, shape or form, was a moving, uh, we've moved away from buckets into streams. And so there was a time when the search function wasn't really that good, where maybe it made sense to take folders that came into your email box and then move them to like this folder or move them to that folder or move them to that folder. Um, you know, nowadays the search function is so good you shouldn't be spending an hour a day just moving emails. And there is no way that nobody can stay up to date in even one field anymore. So that's no longer possible. Just isn't. And then if you're going to spend a lot of time filing and doing things like that, uh, you have even less time. So what you really need to understand is, is that like you need to shift the metaphor that information doesn't really belong in buckets anymore. There are streams of information passing by you all day long, 24 seven. And all that you can do is take some, process it, throw about what you don't need, take some, process it, right? leave stuff for your future self to seize upon, um, those kinds of things. But it's from buckets to streams. And I think uh, there's you can unpack that quite a bit, uh, but it's a total shift in how you go about uh, collecting, analyzing, and sharing information. If you change your perception of the world, won't you change who you will be? Yes, it's to some degree, but we're always changing anyway. You know, in 10 years from now, like, right, like not one cell or almost no cells in your body will still be the same. So we'll be completely different, but there's a narrative that we're following. Um, and, uh, but we make up what's possible for our future by looking at our past as opposed to looking towards our future and having our future determine what's possible and not. Don't know if that makes sense, but it does to me. Uh, makes perfect sense. And I know this was to a previous answer, total sense. Uh, love watching your thought process live, cool. Makes perfect sense to me. Uh, James Clear recently wrote about how it's also useful to think to think of the opposite of what you want and avoid the actions that lead there. Well, that's called uh, addition by subtraction, or that's one way of thinking about it. And that's one of the smartest uh, strategies that is out there. So uh, the idea is, is that instead of thinking, what else can I do? What else can I add, right? Like uh, recognize that oftentimes we cause more harm than good. And so if like, what would, like if I want this job, right? I wanna get a promotion. I can think about what are all the things that would prevent me from getting promoted and let's eliminate those first, right? Um, because we're more certain about those. Um, and so addition by subtraction is moving forward by reducing and eliminating. And so uh, it more often than not is a, is a strategy that is better than most, if that makes sense. So I'm a very big fan. I'm a big fan of James Clear as well. Uh, 
So the more times up to bat, the better the chances of you hitting those home runs. If you are consistently improving, for sure, right? Uh, B do have versus have do be, uh, or have be do. Um, I'm not sure if you're asking me a question there, Jeremy, or if you're referring to what I was talking about last time. Uh, let me know. Hey, Wynn from Nigeria. Uh, yeah, five minutes of creativity. The muse won't chase you. So it's called the temporal lobe, empathy. Interesting. Oh, and that might be it, though. That could be it. I'm not sure. Uh, I can't relate to what you're saying. I'm kind of going through that now. It's hard to look into the future and see yourself. In what way is it hard? Um, like actually seeing yourself or thinking about yourself uh, or how you would like to, what your focus is gonna be on at that time in your life. Um, yeah, tell me more about where the challenge is. Uh, no worries, Cam. I was wondering what happened to you, but glad you're here. Uh, you missed something that Christy said wow about. Um, <laughs> very funny, Chris. Uh, I've, I've actually quoted you a few times in my book just out. Always re remember your point about helping clients see into their blind spots. Oh, well, thank you, Jay. What's the name of your book? Uh, so that we can all know what it is. Um, Okay, Cam. Uh, man, I relate to that heavily about feeling accountable to someone else. When I'm doing it just for me, I slack off sometimes. But when I'm doing it for someone else, I, I do try harder to make sure everything is right. Honestly, I do not like that. Wish I was not like that, honestly. Something to work on for sure. Yes, potentially, Cam. I didn't like that about myself. But what if you didn't need to work on it? What if you could just leverage it and channel it differently so that the person that you feel most accountable to is your future self? Recognize that if you're going to care about anyone, that person, you know, put your oxygen mask on yourself first, right? That's your future self. So that's who you owe the most to. And if you can start with that, then you can leverage what your proclivity is anyway, and now have a much better outcome. I get you, though. I'm on the same page, Cam. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's possible, Christopher, but uh, not the day-to-day -day annoyances. Right, that's what I was talking about that. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, I like thinking about what my ideal day in two. Yeah, I'm sure you do, Chris. You probably are, you'll spend all your time like about everything but the main point. Um, all right, let's see. Someone saying, uh, what's up to Milos? And they're saying hi back. Uh, all right. Right now, there are showing up some spammers. Thanks for sharing. Uh, cool. Uh, Christopher Vogelman, I would imagine that stimulating your imagination to stimulate your self brain cells will make the path easier. Um, I ran across Steeler Winners ad on Facebook. I checked out the order page. I thought it was really cool that you guys have a piano version of Where Is My Mind by the Pixies as the background music for all the entrepreneurs talking. Really cool on touch on that. Thanks, Cam. Uh, this is beyond the moon to listen to this because I find many, many, many moments of being alone and lost because I'm attacking the day, the tasks, the points of work without any realization or plan. Yeah, that's where you put your head on the pillow at night and you're like, what the hell did I even do today? Yet I was busy all day long. Um, love Jordan Peterson stuff. Yeah, he makes me think. Uh, won't knowing what you're looking for blind you to things beyond your beliefs? Or, well, no, um, because this goes back to like the reticular activating system, right? Or signals in the system that the more expertise you have in a field, the more deft you are at spotting things and you noticing what to notice for, right? Or knowing what to notice for. Um, you know, most people just like put out a goal. Um, but there might be many ways that you can get to your goal faster than you currently imagine it. If you keep your eyes open and know what it is that potentially is a signal that that should, something that's pulling you forward, right? Something that engages you, has you lean in, like, 
appreciating that there's a deeper wisdom in you uh, and that uh, and if you can tell it what it is you're trying to where you're trying to get to and you think about what might be potential clues or hints or uh, people or opportunities where you might have the ability to get what it is you want you want it a lot faster that would be a good idea to know what those things are because if you don't think about them ahead of time the likelihood that you will stumble upon them is not very good oh i think i got an, an angry face i've never gotten an angry face that's cool um how do you split your time between learning and doing? Because although just in time is on a need to know basis, sometimes you need longer term knowledge. Yeah, of course. Um, and I, well, so it depends. And it, uh, sorry, I think every time I lean, like it changes the, uh, I don't know if it, is it like, getting dark light, getting dark light. If it is, I apologize. Um, so it depends what the doing looks like. And what I mean by that is, is that when it comes to what I'm working on right now, right, this is all input, but, uh, but I'm also outputting stuff for my future self. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. And in many ways, actually. So let me, so right now, right, like the idea of future self came to me in the past day, right? So I found a bunch of articles on future self and read them through different stages of summarization. And that now sits in a, in Evernote, right? And that some of that will make the job of preparing the presentation on learning easier. I also have other remnants of other presentations from the past where I've talked about learning that I'm pulling forward. I will, um, so the next part of doing though, it, so I'm already doing stuff, right? Even though I'm inputting because I'm going through what's called a progressive summarization. So as I am learning and reading stuff that I find fascinating and interesting, I'm bolding, highlighting and leaving trails so that my, when my future self comes upon it, it will be able to quickly grasp the ideas from it. And, but then the next thing is like in this particular case, the doing really is about me applying it in my life. So that then requires me to actually develop a process for myself, uh, which I'll probably work on tonight. I haven't worked out yet. So I'm going to do that after uh, we're done tonight. <laughs> but uh, I want to then, think about this more. I also know Jordan Peterson has something called, I think the future authoring program or something like that. I think I even have it. Uh, probably going to look at that too, try and get a better sense of that. And, but like, I've often thought that I get paid to think for people. So I have to do more thinking than they would do. And I get paid to solve my problems because I've always felt that, you know, if I have the problem, there's probably a lot of other people out there that have that same problem. So if I can fix a problem of my own, uh, all the better, uh, especially with a new perspective or something like that, because that's what Jones is me. Um, so there's that. But if it's a marketing tactic, then that might be me scribbling something out on paper, putting it in front of Matt, explaining it and asking him to find someone that can build it. So it just depends what the doing is, I guess is my point. And recognizing um, recognizing what outputs need to look like and what are some of the easiest ways to create those. So I wanted to get more clarity on future self. I don't feel like I really have, I thought I'd get more. So I have to now reflect on this, what I shared here, because I don't think I came to anything as conclusive as I'd like to. And I also don't think that I extended the conversation much more than I already had in my head, which I was hoping to take further. Um, so there's that. Like, it, and so the there's another thing for my future self if I'm willing to do, do it, 
which is to really think through the experience tonight and maybe rewatch it with the understanding that I'm looking for places where maybe I had a, I, I made a choice and it was in the wrong direction. I don't know. Not sure yet, but I hope that helps. And if it doesn't ask it a different way. Uh, that's because I was kind of out of the picture for a long time, Chris. He said he hadn't seen my content in years. Good to see you again, too. Uh, yeah, I was kind of semi-retired from 2012 to 2017 or so. And then I was inside Agora for two years, uh, helping them with a bunch of stuff. And then just recently re-released my business. And we're doing it kind of in small, nice little steps. Uh, nice food for thought from New Zealand. Cool. I remember watching load up your treadmill to read years ago. I was amazed at how fast you can take in information. Yeah, I still do that. And that's actually what I'll be doing when I go downstairs, oh, which reminds me, I should be charging my iPad. Um, the, there we go. Um, Cause I will be reading. That's for sure. Uh, hello, Sharon from South Carolina and Paul from London and Anne Marie from Auckland. Uh, when is the next webcast marathon for CLR winners Q and A? I, I think we do it once a quarter, my man. So, uh, that's, uh, three months after the last time, uh, the idea of becoming an accountability buddy with one's future self sounds powerful. Something that could be a potential pitfall for some might be to think they have to arrive in the future to be finally fulfilled. Uh, my reminder is to be someone who finds fulfillment is in the moments of today while enjoying the process of moving towards a compelling vision of the future. Yeah, I would agree with that, Tim. And then I would also say um, that, yeah, it's a, you're never done, right? The, it, the, you never get any place and then, you know, you cross a ribbon or they give you a prize, right? Um, but becoming, being a better you, uh, is something that we can consistently strive to be. And I think that, um, and being satisfied with the progress that we've made, how far we've come, I think is uh, where not, this could be ego, but you know, recognizing that um, we've come a long way, right? Um, <laughs> All right. Uh, looking ahead and establishing long-term goals is an amazing thing to do as it fully utilizes your mental powers, but using intent daily on a written card with a question, how many ways can I continue through uh, stating your intent fires up your brain to mobilize all your mental resources uh, to work for you. Very true. And um, there's something called in implementation intentions and implementation intentions are one of the most powerful, according to science, um, and by powerful gets the best results, uh, productivity techniques, anti-procrastination techniques. I don't know what you want to call it. Stick to a diet techniques. I mean, it depends on how you use it. And an implementation intention is deciding in advance what your reaction is going to be to something that may happen. So, uh, the next time that I tell myself, I don't feel like writing, I am going to uh, take out my pad and write for five minutes, right? Uh, that's an implementation intention, right? When this happens, I plan on doing this. And when people have implementation intentions, the likelihood of them taking that action dramatically increases. So if you're talking about that, Anne-Marie, I totally agree. Uh, and how important do you see the role of content curator right now and in the future? Do influencers have to become curators? Yeah, I, I think ultimately long-term, uh, well, I guess it depends on how you create value. Uh, so I think I, it would start with that. I, you know, when I wrote like the Maven Manifesto, that was kind of authority slash curator, you could say, someone who's tied into the market, what's going on, all those kinds of things. Um, I, might, I was gonna say yes, uh, but I don't think the answer is yes to, uh, Influencers don't have to become curators, but some influencers will. And the reason why is how does that influencer create value? So if the influencer creates value by being entertaining, right? They don't necessarily need to curate. 
if the influencer is an influencer because they have a great body. I don't know that they need to carry it. If the influencer is an influencer because they're up to date with the latest and greatest, then yes, they're probably going to need to be a curator. And there certainly is this idea of curating stuff for your future self, which is part of like what Build a Second Brain is all about. So, um, yeah, I think it's highly relevant. I'm glad you asked that. Uh, Afir, what's up with you? Um, all right. Any thoughts on improving the decision process to make better decisions? Um, I did have a, uh, I just downloaded a video of something I taught about how to make better decisions. Uh, it comes down to your criteria, uh, for one, and, uh, and then it comes down to your maps of the world, which, you know, you can't change in any given decision making moment, but you can attempt to make better decisions. But we'll, I'll revisit that. That's a too big of a topic to take on now. Uh, I took up learning the Enneagram on your suggestion from one of the live streams. Seems like I'm a five. Ah, the investigator. Have you found a way to incorporate it into working with clients? And what is your dominant wing? If you can share. Yeah, well, I'm kind of right in the middle. And it makes sense if you know me. I'm a four, three, four, five. So the three wants achievement in the limelight. The four is like, um, poor me in a way, and the five is kind of the introvert uh, and information. So, and I think I'm all three of those pretty uh, combined. Um, well, if you, I, I talked about me last, uh, the last time that, you know, you might get ideas of like what your purpose is or what it's aligned to or what gives it meaning or what will make you feel fulfilled by looking at where you trend in uh, when you're doing better. I forget what it's called. Um, what app do you use to post the comments on the screen? Ecamm Live. Yes. Uh, this is true. I think that was one of the systems I taught um, or something sounding similar to that. I decided to write a book by speaking daily 1000 words for 66 days. Lead magnet. What do you think about that idea? I like that idea. Did it work? And if it worked, uh, then I think it was fantastic. And if it didn't work, what did you change to make it work? Uh, but I like the idea. Um, okay. So being purposeful in your reading makes sense to me. I'm approaching Katrina Ruth's work with that intent. Thanks. Uh, such a great way to look at it. 10 year. What do I need to know to be question? Also use the same questions for goals, maybe weekly, monthly, yeah, well, I would check in with your future self. Like, how did you do for them this month? How is their life going to be made better because of what you did this past month? Uh, Ferrugia, what would you advise someone who is naturally good at copywriting to do to get into companies such as Agora? What training learning should they undertake? Um, they should analyze a sales letter every day. Uh, they should... And Pete wrote up a great whole thing on that. And I, that's also in the in the Strategic Profits group, if you scroll all the way down, Pete Coyne. Uh, and uh, if you study a piece of copy a day and break it down and turn it into an outline, uh, within a very short period of time, you'll be good. And then you just have to contact the world and be willing to write something on spec. And if it pulls, they'll hire you. You're welcome, John. You're welcome, Joe. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, Timeline Therapy by Tad James uh, could be helpful for thinking about the future self. I think the self-authoring program might be really good, but I haven't gone through it, so I don't know. Um, part of seeing myself is being honest with myself and what I can push myself to be or become at age 62. Just how fast can I learn the rest of what I will need to create the future I'm trying to see for myself? I'm trying to find that way to stand out in the crowd just what is going to take to make that happen i'm not sure of so it's the unknown things of not been able to put in place to see a clear picture of myself in the future if that makes sense well so don what i would say is that some of that 
I get, right? Some of that, but some of it is, um, I'm going to say I would caution you against because I that's not the right way to say it. What I would say is, is that and maybe, maybe instead of thinking about the how, you could think more about the embodiment. Um, so instead of like, for example, trying to find the, that, that way to stand out in the crowd, what would it be like to be someone who does stand out naturally? And what would that person who naturally just stands out, uh, what would you need to change to be that? And maybe you can't do that, but I'm, but not just thinking about what you need to do or get or have, but also to think about who you need to be. So who would you need to be to create the future and learn what you need to learn fast enough? Who would you need to be where people would notice you and you would stand out even if you weren't doing anything different? Um, so that's where I'm going with it, Don. So I just want to kind of clarify that, yeah, you might not have some of these answers, but just because you don't have the answers doesn't mean that you don't have the answers on who you would need to be, right? Just because you're not clear on how to get there and what is you, what you're going to be doing doesn't mean that you can't be clear about the other elements, if that makes sense. Uh, do you meditate or have you done so in the past? I read that one thing billionaires or as the top CEOs have in common is that a large number meditate. Um, I have meditated and I go back and forth with it quite a bit. I'm a huge fan of Sam Harris uh, and his meditation program. I used to use Headspace a long time ago. Um, there's something also called the presence process. I've never done it. I've always wanted to do it. It's I, I believe it's 20 minutes of uh, uh, of continuous breathing. Um, so it's not like, you know, you're just always either breathing in or out. There's never a pause for those 20 minutes. And I want to do that because I find that I can trance out because I've hypnotized myself and gotten hypnotized so many times that oftentimes when I'm meditating, I'm really not meditating. I'm kind of just left. And so I think keeping myself present by the breathing in and out that way uh, would be very helpful for me, but I haven't done it. Uh, cool. Inspired to journal again after reading your report. Big realization is that I never could really read my handwriting after I wrote it. That is a lost opportunity. So I tried uh, print style instead of cursive writing. It's a bit slower, but that has made my writing by hand more readable and more fruitful. I write by, I write, that's the way I write. Um, I write in uh, block letters. Um, and I guess it's a little bit slower, but it's not very much slower. I don't know. Um, and I just enjoy it. But I'm glad, Leon. Uh, hi, Rich. Thanks for sharing. I do 100% follow your thinking on being me and bringing that voice out and into the world. I'm not a procrastinator, but I'm probably afraid of going all in. Any advice? Um, well, I think we're all afraid of different things, right? And, um, and the, but what, What's the fear, uh, Sophus? Is it, um, you know, I really, to me, it seems so insightful and I, I don't think it lands on people the same way, but for me, that Susan Jeffers book, uh, Feel the Pain and Do It Anyway, or Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway, just seems to make a lot of sense to me. And her whole like point or thesis was, is that there's like, we trick ourselves because what you think about, what's the worst thing that can happen and then if that were to happen, could you handle it? And if the answer is yes, then there really is nothing to be afraid of. You can handle it. Um, so so there's that part to it. And um, I'd say the other part is that if you believe that there's an opportunity, most opportunities come and go quickly. And so if, and so if you feel that it's your moment and you don't step forward, you might always regret it. And that would be a shame, right? So 
the the question is is Sophus is what do you do instead of doing that right um, what when you if you're not a procrastinator uh, yeah uh, explain to me more what you're afraid of you think um, have you ever used a ch checklist of perpetual lenses when approaching a problem so you can approach it from different angles uh, I tend to look at things using theory of constraints but maybe that is the only that is like only having a hammer in the toolbox and treating every problem as a nail yeah I would say so I don't have a, I don't have as many as I think I'd like I mean but um, and like with theory of constraints I'm so used to it I think I I don't need to look at anything my brain just naturally goes there um, but yeah I mean I'm constantly thinking of I'm much more fascinated though with like these power laws um, kind of these distinctions right uh, that help you see things and be able to capitalize on things that only other seasoned veterans in the field would but I don't know if that'll ever turn into anything more than just my me being fascinated by it um, but theory of constraints is an extremely powerful methodology one of the most powerful if especially if you've studied it more than just like reading the goal and you know some of his books uh, yes exactly Deborah be the person right that you need to be now and act from there uh, is there a specific school method of hypnosis you were using uh, when I did hypnosis uh, all kinds direct suggestion indirect suggestion Milton Erickson NLP style uh, psycholinguistics like all that kind of crap <laughs> uh, hey Denise uh, so happy to catch you again really good stuff recurated content and entrepreneurs what is the line on sharing other people's content I see so many people so many taking classes and then they turn around and teach it even with the second brain content there's Tiago and Jim quick is it anything goes make it your own who's a better marketer I don't like does Jim teach what Tiago teaches like I've heard Jim speak a couple times and I've never heard them even talk about the same things whereas Jim's really more of a memory expert isn't he um, well at the end of the day it is who's the better marketer I guess but not in those two because they're not alike um, and the what I try and do is give as much credit as I can while at the same time be working to improve the idea enough not just a little bit but enough that it's no longer the same idea and if I can then eventually it becomes something that I teach and I'll always remember where I got it from the original idea but if I can't and I think it's really important to share then I'll just share it citing that other person and uh, yeah but you know I've I've seen my stuff taken so many places and I'm just at the end of the day all you can be is flattered um, let's see Rich, I support some of the, my followers to grow their social media presence. And one way of getting Facebook algorithms to show your live stream to more of your followers is to get more people to hit the heart and thumbs up button in the comment section below. The more hearts and thumbs ups you get, it tells the algorithm that people are enjoying your live and pushes the algorithm to show it to more people. Just trying to give a little back because you provide so much value. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. You heard Farouk. Pass the word. Uh, I feel I have a voice, something of my heart, but not sure if it's good enough. And for sure, and for unsure if, if I go all in, probably just some people fear inside my brain. Um, well, you won't really know until you jump out and do it, right? So, um, yeah, I don't. It's. Yeah, I mean, if you don't do it right, you always have the, you can always have that as an excuse of why you didn't succeed, but ultimately you'll fail anyway. And, um, and I guess it's also just your perspective on life. I, I just feel that any place that you settle in life, you basically, it doesn't even pay to be alive in that area of your life anymore. So it's not about ending with the best. It's not about having the best. 
It's about enjoying the most experiences and being engaged with life. And for me, if you're doing that, then uh, then that's what true living is all about. And if that's the case, how does this, what you're kind of afraid to go all in on, how could that ever impact that? If anything, sitting on the sidelines is impacting that because you're delaying your life. And when you postpone your life, uh, you don't get it back. You don't get it back. And, you know, if you've ever looked at what the most common regrets are from the deathbed, most common regrets are is that they didn't go for the things they wanted to go for. They let other people's desires for them, other people's dreams for them. Uh, they're, they're regrets of omission, not regrets of commission, right? They're not regrets for things that people did. More often than not, it's regrets for th things not done, opportunities not taken. And when, when you really kind of embrace that, like pe people at the end of their lives are giving advice to people who are still in their lives. And we've heard it for decades that the biggest regrets in life come from uh, omission. Well, you're, you know, you're not going to be the exception, right? And so hopefully that helps. Uh, um, how far into the future would you consider your future self? I'm 48. I'm 49. Um, so I don't know. I'm thinking a decade. But, you know, if you've got certain goals, if you've got certain five-year goals, then maybe it's five years. Um, you know, you can even have a one-year goal of who you want to be in a year from now. Um, like I said, I, like uh, this just occurred to me, so I, I don't, I haven't done much of anything except think about it up to this point. And it's something that I'm going to incorporate into my learning presentation, but I just feel like this is a huge, uh, point of view and asset that if we can take on and make life as easy as possible for that person, we will benefit greatly and we will build the business of our dreams that much faster. I'm working on so many theories and ideas that I've come up with, figure out, etc., and I want to finalize it before I go out with it, but it's taken me forever. Should I just share a piece of it or wait until it's completed? Uh, I, I don't know what's next. Um, I believe that the more interaction with the public, the sooner, the better. So um, you really, and you're depriving yourself of the feedback that might be very important so that when you develop a new idea and a new idea, you, you don't have the feedback from that first idea and the second idea. And so you put yourself at a disadvantage. And so, so my thought is, is that this, the, the earlier and more often that things can be shipped, delivered, brought into public, see the light, et cetera, uh, the better. And that, uh, it's easier to get someone's attention to show them something that takes five minutes than it does take an hour. And you can use this stuff to start building a following, whether it's a tweet storm, whether it's a blog post, whether it's a long post in Facebook, whether it's a video or a live stream or whatnot. But um, the sooner you interact with the world, the better off you are. I'm sorry to hear that, Deborah. Uh, my son died two years ago. We don't know when our time is up. Live full out today. Close the gap between your desires and your fears. Hells yeah. Uh, let your dreams be bigger than your fear. Decide that. Yeah, take on a bigger problem. Right. That's that's the other thing. Um, you know, notice ever notice like when you're dealing with lots of little problems and then you all of a sudden get a big problem and how you just totally forget about the little problems. Life becomes very clear when you're like working on a big problem. And part of what gives like allows you to transcend how you wound up being because who you are today is not who you are. It's how you wound up being today. Right. And if you want to be at your best, you need something to pull you from outside yourself. 
And that's a cause that's bigger than yourself. And a cause that's bigger than yourself pulls out from you uh, more than you could ask of yourself. And it allows you to do things that you wouldn't just do if you were just serving your own selfish interest. A cause bigger than yourself often is a problem, a big problem that, uh, that you want to dedicate yourself to, to solve, right? And so I was thinking about actually talking about that uh, earlier today. I was thinking about that before I decided future self. Um, and that, let's see, what was I going to talk about? It was, hold on. Um, let's see, all notes. Let's see, it was, oh, I'm not going to find it. Maybe if I could just go back to the question. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, I'll save the the problem bigger, like the problem stuff, because I don't want to start searching for it. But um, and you, I think you looked pretty young, if I remember correctly. Um, so was, so there is that. Um, I'm gonna go move on because. I'm getting in my head about something. I don't know why. All right. Uh, let's see. All right. I understand what you said. I believe be the person that stands out and key on the, in on those things that seem to take off, so to speak. Push what works to increase my reach when I can and let it grow more natural. That it will probably make being more real and focused on my desires in the long run. Yes, but it's also about recognizing that... Um, there is no one fixed Don. There is no one fixed Rich. That we are different people in different contexts of our life. And so who does Don need to be? To be someone who stokes in the attention of the people around him. Who does he need to be? Not what does he need to do? You know, and it was like the longest time it took me to really appreciate that this idea, Don, that uh we can be valuable without doing anything, right? And as someone who's a perfectionist and stuff like that, uh, part of the subtext of being a perfectionist is that you are valuable based on what you do, not who you are. And so I remember when I was going to a psychologist and they were trying to kind of get me to understand it more than just a concept, right? That people can be valuable. I mean, I understand it, um, but really kind of own it. But then I was thinking about like my friend, Todd Brown and Todd is a funny guy. And I've had so many good times with Todd that if I see his face, it puts me in a better mood. Like if he comes into the room, I'm in a better mood. He doesn't have to do anything. I value Todd just for who he's being. And once I understood that, then I could see how I do that with lots of people. And once I could do that, then I wasn't too far of a stretch to imagine that there are people who get value from my presence without me having to do anything either. Right. So. It isn't. Um, it isn't act as if and it isn't. Um, it's more of a question to sit in, like, who would I need to be? to be someone who attracted the attention of those around me, not doing anything, just as a question to sit in, to think about, to, and to possibly notice for people who do do that. Uh, I'm not saying that's going to be the only answer, and I'm not saying that it will be the answer. I'm just saying as a perspective to kind of think about uh, that you can learn new strategies anywhere at any time from any person not just from a course, right? You can go into any environment with the intention that you are going to spot something that is going to help you with X or Y, and you're much more likely to see it, right? 
So if you have the intention of being the type of person, whatever that type of person is, that automatically attracts attention and stands out. Um, it's something to think about. And then potentially, as you think about it, opportunities might open up. I'm not saying it will. I'm just saying it might. Uh, sorry to hear about that, Deborah. Same. How would journaling help in creating the future best self? Uh, well, you could you could describe your future self. You could write to your future self. Um, there's something called third person authoring uh, or something like that. Uh, and I've read good stuff about it. I don't know. I don't remember really anything more than that, though. And it was like writing in your journal about yourself like third person, like Richard woke up late this morning. And because he woke up late, he was not in a good mood. He was actually concerned, nervous, and worried that he wasn't going to make it in the office in time when Matt, when he told Matt he'd be there by nine. That had him thrust out of bed, right? Uh, whatever. I don't write my journal that way. Uh, but, uh, but writing about yourself in third person so you're somewhat disassociated can be helpful. So I imagine same here. If you're writing to your future self from your present self, uh, you know, how did you do for them today? If you are describing your future self, thinking about who you always wanted to be, um, who you most value and admire and what do you value and admire in those people, you know, um, who would you need? Like if you've ever done that exercise that was in like the seven habits, highly effective people and a bunch of other books, like write your eulogy. Uh, what do you want people to say about you at your funeral? And then who would you need to be in order to be that person that people would describe in that way? So there's a million ways, right? And then there's the whole future authoring program. Um, you could ask yourself a lot of questions about yourself in the future. Um, and so those are some ways, Richard. Uh, How many books do you reckon you currently read in a year and do you take notes from most of them? Um, I, I tend to do a couple blitz blitzes over the course of the year and I'm not really sure what that might look like. They can be like a book a day, um, sometimes more. But normally, I'm good for reading three to four books in a week and taking notes on one or two. And then there are some periods of time where it goes peak, and then I'm doing a lot. But I spend time with a lot of the notes that I've already taken. And uh, I'm good for an hour and a half, two hours a day for it at a minimum. It's what I enjoy doing. I wish I could do it just all day long. Uh, no, thank you, Chris. We do get value from your presence. You're very assuring without saying much at all. I feel like I've been saying a crap load today, but I do appreciate it, Christopher. Uh, what do you think of Maltz's Theater of the Mind? Um, it's a self-hypnosis technique. I think it's powerful. Uh, Sophus, thanks for the great advice and thoughts, Rich. Cool. Stephen Covey's obituary is an awesome technique. Yeah. Um, I got to find my old one. I wrote it a long time ago. I'd be curious to read it. Uh, thanks for your ideas. It, I think it's an energy thing. What Don was asking about, about being and acting from your truth, which is of high energy, and so will resonate with your people. Yeah, well... Some people are going to gravitate towards that high energy person. Some people are not, right? And so, but there is a way that you can, I'm, I don't know what it is. Um, my girlfriend tells me, like, I, when I have, I'm not sure how, when I have this, if she says it in an unpleasant way, maybe that's why I'm having a hard time remembering it. But I have, I'm like, I feel as if I'm superior. Um, I, I'm giving off that energy and attitude. Uh, oftentimes people think I'm famous. Uh, you know, where they're like, do you know, who is that guy? Um, and stuff like that. And so like, that's an example of what I'm trying to share with Don that a lot of times it can be how you hold yourself. You don't 
change a thing except who you're being. Um, and it's, it's not having you be something that you're not. It, but at the same time, it's recognizing that you are no oneself. And like, I remember having a conversation like two weeks ago with my friend, uh, Scott Oldsford. Um, and we're talking about um, spiral dynamics, um, Fred Graves' model, um, and oh my God, Robert Kagan's model. And, um, and in Claire Graves' model, I'm like, I have one more level, so to speak, to go, at least when I took the test, God knows how many years ago. And someone who is proficient in uh, that testing methodology and it, what the scores mean uh, told me that where I am, uh it's like you know this is like the matrix there's you know there is no spoon um where i am i am trying to figure out who i am right like who am i who am i right what am i all about and the next stage of evolution is to recognize that that that's an illusion that you are a different person in every context at every moment and so there is no you right the you that you think you are is a superstition and that so you actually have a lot more possibilities than you recognize you think that you just have a bunch of different options but you're not seeing the possibilities around that and i don't know if that makes sense it makes total sense to me i if you understand what those words really mean but it, for those for most of you i don't know that it will um but yeah, I mean, look at Gandhi didn't wear fancy clothes and he wasn't a joker, but he was able to, um, you know, get quite a bit of attention. Right. Um, so I just, it's more than just, uh, being convinced that it's uncomfortable before you even are clear about who you need to be, uh, I think closes options off and, uh, and has you kind of not stepping forward in a way with all of your power where someone, not you, Denise, but Don, um, where the opportunity to be someone who gets, you know, who stands out, um, what might be overlooked with that line of thinking, if that makes sense. Uh, hi, Rich, if you were me watching your Facebook lives, what would you do next with all the new insights? How do you, how would you process and analyze them? If, well, okay. So if I was watching myself and I liked myself, um, which I guess I would be if I was watching, um, I would probably take notes on anything that I said that really resonated. So I might, might have my journal open, might have a pad of paper or a couple index cards. And anytime he said something that resonated with me, I would write it down. And then I would, uh, maybe after I, after it was done, I would take a look at those and throw out a few right away that, you know, cause we tend, I, at least for me, I tend to take more notes than I need. And then next I would, or am I going to understand what these all are? Do I understand the context of all these and will I in a bit, like after some time is uh, taken? And if not, if I won't, then I'll add a little bit to it. So I know what I'm talking about. Uh, then from there, maybe like the next day or whatever, I would look at that, those index, that index cards or whatever, those notes and think about, is there any of this that I want to use right now? And if yes, pick something. And if not, uh, file it away to stumble upon and some future date. That's how I would kind of look at it. Or if you're asking me a question, I'd reflect on what my answer was and whether or not that's advice that you want to follow. And if it's not, um, then understand why it's not advice you want to follow. Try to understand why I gave you that advice and why I might be wrong and you might be right. Or what was I taking into account that you weren't or you were taking into account that I wasn't. 
and just to potentially make an idea better. Hopefully that helps, Jeremy. Uh, awesome question. Very esoteric. I, sorry. Which part, Paul? I do. Well, the whole being part, I guess, is I did see that. It is very esoteric. But how do you... People give off different energies, right? Like, and I'm not talking about in that foo-foo uh, way. You just, like, when someone just got, you know, if so, even if someone tries to fake it, if they're, if they just were yelling at their spouse versus someone else who's, like, had the most pleasant morning, you can see the difference in someone. Uh, wow, that's a long one. Uh, let's see. This is, uh, so so tell me, oh, this is a long one. Okay, uh, sorry I had to jump in and out today. I caught your riff on Future Self and it keyed up my memory of the first 24 hour live webinar you did way back in the day, yeah, back in 2008 and all the technology challenges you overcame. Found it interesting that you re-entered the internet entrepreneurs arena again using a 24 hour live presentation for CSAB. Past self, future self, it worked and works for you. Uh, that's pressure and performance. I've been thinking about designing a business around your worst day, not your best day, since you mentioned it a couple weeks ago. And the assumed simplicity and focus brought into your world. Also, um, you mentioned turning over the profit responsibility sooner to others on your team and the difference that makes. Anyways, listening for the leverage points I can apply, you caused me to think, and I know how much it helped me in the, helped in the early days. I started journaling in May. The hidden obstacles has helped inspire and direct that more fully along with the Facebook lives. Thank you for the great value as always, you know, and thank you, Carlin, for being one of my original uh, clients. If it wasn't for people like you, I wouldn't be doing this now. Um, Cause not everybody in the world is buying coaching. That's for sure. Uh, thank you. Very helpful. All right. Well, so let me put up the uh, thing again here, our Facebook group. I can. And uh, let me turn this off. Cool. And uh, so, yep, yeah, we are wrapping up. If anyone's got a last question, I'll be glad to take it. If not, I got one more day in Baltimore right now. And uh, then I guess I'm heading back to New York. And then I'm going to, I don't know if, I don't know if I'm going to stay here some more, go back. I was actually kind of looking forward to hanging out in Baltimore quite a bit, but the whole city's closed. And that makes it kind of boring staying in a hotel where there's nobody staying. With, a, with no restaurants. Um, and when I walk on the streets, it's completely empty. So I feel like I'm in a movie and I don't know how fun it is. I mean, being in a hotel room. So uh, I guess we'll wrap a minute or two early tonight. Thanks guys for joining me. Uh, I'll share some of the stuff that I put into this learning presentation. Uh, as well in the next live stream. Uh, but think about future self. I'll be thinking about it a lot more. Uh, might extend next week into that if I have a lot to share. I'm not anticipating that because I really need to finish the uh, learning uh, presentation. Um, but but it might be hard for me to resist. So uh, yeah, I know I've given you a lot to think about then. And uh, I hope it wasn't too much. Uh, yes my dystopic Baltimore movie. Um, so yeah. Uh, so until Tuesday at 2 PM, uh, the higher profits beyond this is rich Sheffrin over and out.